every single year, as your life changes, as your business grows, you want to make sure that you're going back in and reevaluating the assets that you have and the risk that you may be taking on. Had I done this, I would have been able to increase the value of the contents in my business and I would have had a lot more money when tragedy happened. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. This is gonna be a little different. I'm actually answering questions that you guys sent in via social media and email to the show for me to answer here on the air. So if you have questions, you can send yours to media at candyvalentino.com. And every single month, we're gonna be going through some of the best questions and I'm gonna answer them here on the show. So let's get started. So top three mistakes I see most business owners making. Let's dive in to this one. Well, okay, so when I came out on the scene at the end of 2019, when I exited my last company, I realized that there were a lot of people talking about mindset and how to start a business, but most people weren't talking about how to sustain a business. So I would say the number one thing that I see is people not developing their AQM around business finance. They wait because they don't understand it. They try to learn all the marketing, all of the sales tactics, how to do Facebook ads and all these things. But what business really comes down to is the numbers, the data. And when we know and we can make business decisions from data and from numbers, we can be more informed and we won't bleed money out of our bottom line. Because business at its core, it's not just about what we make, it's also what we keep. And business finance is what's gonna teach us that. So I would say that's number one. And how can you change that? Developing the skills, making sure that it's just like a language. Finance in general, personal finance, business finance, is all a language, just like us trying to learn French, right? We have to look at the book. We have to study the book. We have to get familiar with it. And so that's the same thing with finance. We got to get our balance sheets, understand what our, our QuickBooks is saying to us. What are those P&Ls sharing? You know, what is the POS system or the CRM that you're using? What's that data saying? So that we can really understand where your customers come from, what type of customers are actually profitable for you, because not all customers are profitable. Some of them suck the living life out of you and your profitability, and knowing what really moves the needle so that you can spend more of your time there. That would be one. The second, I would say, is most people are thinking that they own a business, but they're actually self-employed. Now, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with that. If somebody wants a lifestyle business and they just want to make money on the side or they want to be able to be remote, there is nothing wrong with that. I don't glamorize one or the other. But most people just don't know what they're building. They don't realize that they're building a job. So it's really important for any entrepreneur to really identify who they are. Are you the entrepreneur? Are you a manager? or are you the talent? So most people start out as the talent, right? They are already doing something for someone else and they just wanna do it for themselves as a freelancer or on the side. Nothing wrong with that. But what happens then is as you start to build a business, if you're the talent, you're gonna get really kind of like angst when you have to focus on marketing, sales, growing a team, because if you really enjoy being the talent, doing the services or providing them, then you're not gonna be able to do that as you step into growing a big company. So it's important to know who you are. If you're the entrepreneur, like I've been my whole life, which most people starting out are not entrepreneurs, it has to be developed, but I have the very odd story of being around my dad since the time I was five. He's an entrepreneur in his mechanic shop I was exposed to that. So I've just been an entrepreneur forever. I get frustrated when I have to be the talent. Like even doing this podcast and showing up, like that's to me the talent role. And it's so incongruent that sometimes I have to remember that it's okay to step into one of the other roles, but always know who you are. If you love providing a service, if you love being a graphic designer, if you love, you know, doing massage, if you love doing electric, and now you try to build a big business, you may actually hate what you're doing. So always know who you are. The manager, on the other hand, think of it as like the project manager, more of a COO role. Somebody that's keeping everything afloat, managing all the products, doing all the, th and loves to see the progress, but they don't want to be the visionary and have all of the weight of the world on their shoulders. And they also don't want to provide all of the services face to face with the client. When you know who you are, then you can hire all the other people that you need because you need all of them in a, to have a really successful business. I think that's number two that I see people doing that they don't realize it's creating this inner civil war because they're being incongruent with themselves day to day. 
The third, I would say, and everyone's going to hate this. I I already know I'm going to get shit for this, but it it needs said, and I always say I have no problem saying something that I think is going to be polarizing if it's the truth. The third thing is I would say everyone, for some reason, again, this is social media, feels that they need to build a business around their purpose. And I think it's the biggest crock of shit. Sorry, excuse my language, but like it is. It One of these things that we hear that makes us feel like we don't have a purpose, like you're a human being. The fact that you're on this earth, you get to choose every day to be present and have purpose. Like if you sit on your couch and wait to have a purpose, that might never come. Instead, taking the steps forward and choosing to be purposeful in your day, whether that's doing this interview or working with a client or working with a teammate, one of those things might not be my purpose, but I can be purposeful when I'm connecting with the person in front of me. So I think building a business around your purpose or your passion even can can really lead people down the wrong path. Let's say, obviously mine, one of my passions, I love helping animals. I love helping kids. If I would have made my nonprofit into a business, I would have probably hated it. But instead, what I did was build a business that could make money, that could accumulate wealth, that I could create assets and have a net worth, and then I can donate money to whatever my purpose or passion may be. So I think we don't have to choose. And I think if we start to wrap a business around something that we enjoy, number one, it can become a problem. But number two, as we know, when we were 15 or 25 or 40, like our passions change all the time. So if you think that you only have one passion and you build a business around it, I think you're going to build a really boring life, and eventually you're going to get tired of it. So my whole philosophy, build a business that you love, that's aligned with who you are, know which role you are in the business, and develop your financial acumen, and then you're unstoppable. Okay, this question we got came in from someone who read my book, Wealth Habits, and they heard about the story that I told when I was writing that book that I actually got the phone call that nobody wants when my dad was in a horrible motorcycle accident with his girlfriend. And we don't need to go into all of the details of what happened, but really the result of it was that, you know, my dad being self-employed did not have certain insurance policies. His girlfriend, on the other hand, who had a full-time job, worked for a bank for a really long time, did. And so it really changed my view because until that happened, I used to think like disability insurance, for example, was a waste. Until you have something happen, and this is, I think, why insurance is as boring and dry of a topic as it is, is so important. So this specific question is asking, you know, what are some of the the topics that, or what are some of the policies I feel are important for people to have? And I think I'm going to make this general, whether you're in business or not. Um, For me, this is a really important topic because at one point, I probably, like many people listening, did not ever want to spend needless money on insurance. Most people don't, right? Because you think that something's not going to happen to you. But having myself, this is just my own experience, having my dad being in a really horrible accident, having um, a building that burnt, having, having a business that was in a building that caught fire, knowing all of that loss that can happen in a split second and the, how life can change, it really made me rethink. And I'm going to tell you why this is so important. This one thing, had I done this, had I listened to a podcast like this, had I actually done what you're supposed to do in business, I probably would have saved myself over a million dollars, if not more. I I think it's a million because I don't want to be sick, make myself any sicker and say two million, but it's probably closer to two million because I did not do what I'm going to tell everybody else to do. Every single year, as your life changes, as your business grows, you want to make sure that you're going back in and reevaluating the assets that you have and the risk that you may be taking on, especially if you have a business. Had I done this, I would have been able to increase the value of the contents in my business, the value of the building that it would have cost to rebuild it, and I would have had a lot more money when tragedy happened. So there's a few policies that you want to make sure you have. As a business owner, a business owner's policy is normally a bundle where you get commercial liability and you have all these other things that you need, business interruption and so forth. The most important part though is to know whatever you get when you open your doors isn't going to be the same limits that when you're five, 10, or 20 years down the road. So you have to do the boring work of going in with your agent every single year and make sure that you're taking a look at what your business is doing now, what assets that you have, and any new risk that you may have taken on that you didn't even know about. So that's one. If you don't have a business or you do, two things. 
making sure that you have either a PLU, personal liability umbrella, or a commercial liability umbrella. So per personal is more on your personal assets. So let's say I'm driving down the street and I have my business car and my business name and I run someone over at the stop sign. Whatever my car limits are, are not going to pay for that. So what's going to happen is someone's going to come sue me civilly. The only time this matters is if you have assets. If you go after someone who has no assets, then a civil suit doesn't matter because there's nothing to go after. But someone with assets, it opens you up to a lot of risk. So a personal liability umbrella will bridge the gap of where your coverage stops and your risk starts. So it's really important and it's super cheap typically for personal liability umbrella. It just gives you that layer of protection. So again, let's say you have kids, and you have a bunch of kids over to your home, and one of the kids slips, hits his head, and drowns in your pool. Your homeowner's insurance policy is most likely not going to have limits that's going to cover that, but a personal liability umbrella would. Same thing on the commercial side. If you put a bunch of homes, a bunch of your rental properties into like one LLC because you don't want the complexity of all these returns, which I actually recommend depending on what your situation is, make sure that you don't overcomplicate your situation with bank accounts and returns and all these things, you can put some like properties that are low value into one LLC, and then you can kick in a, com a commercial liability umbrella so that God forbid something happened that they wouldn't be able to access all of the assets inside of the LLC. So that would be the second thing. So the first one, of course, was business owner's policy. The second would be a personal or commercial liability policy. And then the third, again, this is probably something I wouldn't have thought of before, but I do think it's important for people to look into some sort of disability insurance. Because when I did all the research for the book, I realized that most Americans have life insurance, but that doesn't kick in until you die. Although your chances of being severely hurt, injured, or hospitalized is five times greater than anything of, of risk of your death. So we all have a greater risk to be disabled, to not be able to work, even if it's for a period of time. So although disability insurance is very expensive and you do have to watch because some of them are complete ripoffs, you may want to at least consider looking into it because it was, of, of all the data, most Americans have a lot of risk because they don't have disability insurance. So that would be something to at least consider. Okay, so this question is, if I were to start a brick and mortar business today in 2023, what would I start? Okay, so first off, I think it's important to understand that anytime you're starting something, I like to make sure that it's recession proof, something that has a simplistic business model, something that needs little innovation that I can maybe just market better or provide better value or better service than a competitor. So knowing what I know and being in the obviously business world for 25 years, I would be looking at starting something like whether it's home repair, like electrical, plumbing, anything like that, because no matter what, if the, if the market dips down and we go into a recession at any point, people are going to need things in their home repaired. They're not going to go out and buy all the new things. They're going to try to make what they have work. So although that sounds very boring, boring can still make you rich. I would be looking at that. I'd also be looking at possibly a laundry mat because it's passive income. You don't need a lot to maintain or manage, but it's a great way even in recessions that it's recession proof. Another service-based business like salons, those are pretty recession proof. When I did all the research back into like the 1930s, even when the actual recession was here, people were still getting their hair done. So it's one of the last things that women will ever cut out of their budget is hair services. So it's pretty recession proof as well. And even an insurance agency, like insurance is something that's also been around forever and it's pretty recession proof. People still need to have their insurance to drive their car or own a home because it's one of the few services that, that our government mandates that you have or that loan officers mandate that you have. So those would be some of the things I would be thinking about, but it's always easier to own a business, start a business with something that you have experience in. But any business that you start, you want to have experience of some sort in it. It's going to it's going to help you be successful. So if I have experience in plumbing, I'm not going to probably go start an insurance agency. If I don't have experience in any of those things, I would probably be looking at a laundromat. Or is there something that you don't have to have a license for that you can hire other people, other talents, and you be the entrepreneur? That's how I would start to look at it. But the thing is to always to remember that some of these businesses may not sound sexy. They're not tech. They're not some new innovation, but they're really easy in order to grow and scale and to make money from. Okay, this question is, 
If you are a service provider and you're trading time for money, how can you make more money without trading time? So when I think of this, I'm assuming the person's asking is like maybe a tax accountant doing services or an attorney or even like say a hairstylist or a copywriter, right? Where you're actually putting time in, how can you make more money? So there's three ways that you can scale. That is people, places, and products. So, and it depends on the industry you're in, which one of these that you can actually use in order to grow your revenue without actually trading more time for it. So people, can you hire people that are doing the services that you're providing so that you're not doing it all the time and you take a portion of whatever that they're making, right? That would be people growing your team. That's one way that you can always set up a business so that you're not always having to trade time for money. The second is places, right? And that could be square footage inside of your existing business, making sure that every single square foot that's in that brick and mortar is somehow making money, either with another service provider that's providing services or products of some sort that could be sold um, or even rented out by being able to like sublet another space inside of your space. So that's another. If you have a successful business and you're already maxed out at that location, it would be adding another location to basically rinse and repeat what you've already done. That's another way in order to, you know, grow your revenue without without it costing you more time. And the third is product. Is there another product or service, an ancillary revenue stream that you can create that will complement what you're already doing, that will be offered to the customers that you already have? Have, but that doesn't cost you time. This could be something like an online course or a product, maybe a workshop or something that you can do, or some way that you can package the knowledge that you're already that you already have and sell it to people so that you aren't always having to trade time and work with people face to face. So again, it's people. If you can add people onto your staff, onto your team, hire employees, hiring subcontractors, it's a place, a physical space. If you can actually add or some or cut that up somehow. Um, also, you're just selling your spaces. Like if you have a home and you have a garage that you're not using or a parking space in your building that you're not using, you can also rent those out and make money on the side that way. But then the third is probably what most people are going to go to. It's what product or service can you offer that you don't have to trade time for it. This could even be aligning or collaborating with somebody else that does something and referring your clients to them and just getting a percentage off of it so you don't have to build it all from scratch. But those are pretty much the three primary ways that you can build your business, grow your revenue, and not trade time for it. Okay, so this question is if you could go back and tell your younger self one piece of wisdom, knowing what you know now from who you are now, what would it be? You know, it's interesting. I, I think I only got asked this question like one other time in a hundred media interviews that I've done. And it's really important because I think when people ask me these types of questions, they typically want some tactics, some, you know, the house hack or what I would invest in or all of that. But I think there's something more important than that. If I could go back and just remind her of something or just give her one piece of wisdom, it would be that everything you're about to do is going to seem really hard. You're going to want to quit. You're going to have no clue what the next step is or if you're even making the right decision. It would just be giving her the encouragement to continue, to keep taking that step forward even when you don't know what to do, to not give up, to just keep playing the long game because the life that you're going to build is beyond your wildest imagination now. <laughs> And that makes me so emotional because I know so many people give up when they're just three feet from gold and it gets hard and they want to quit. And I've had those days. I still have those days because there's always another level that we're always trying to break through. And with each of those levels comes new pressure, new things we got to figure out. But if you just remember on your worst days and you look back at everything that you've done, everything you faced, everything that you've overcome, every adversity that was thrown your way, and you remember that you survived 100% of your worst days, and you're going to figure out this next thing too. That's what I would want her to remember on the days when she questioned whether she was going to make payroll, <laughs> when she questioned, like, how am I going to lead this person that's twice my age, when she questioned, like, oh my gosh, what do I know about construction and rental properties, right? We don't know what we don't know, but if we keep taking the next step forward, that's the only way to build the life of your dreams. And I promise you that the grind, the hustle, the question, 
The doubt is worth it. Believe more in your own ability than the opinions of others, and you can do anything that you ever want to accomplish.